Uh, my husband and I have been waiting actually three years to share what God's doing in Guatemala. It's so exciting that um, we have been, twice now we've been down there with a group, and some of you have helped us in many ways. You've uh, made blankets for the babies, you've donated things for us, and contributed in different various ways, and um, we're just really glad to be here. Um, before I, I want to welcome today especially Ron Cook, who is the, where is he? Ron Cook. He is the CEO of Broken Chains for Humanity, and you'll hear from him later. Also, Dr. Danny and his niece, Dr. Danny and his niece, Tanya. They, you'll also see more of them. Um, they have a great story of how God has moved with Broken Chains. They actually are Guatemalans, actually lived in the place, I think, where we work. And uh, so it's really exciting to have them here. So um, we hope that you're excited about it, as we are, about our presentation today, and we pray that God touches your heart as he has touched ours. Surely our, uh, you're welcome to meet with us after church and, and talk to us. But right now, we're going to show a few minute eclipse. Now, this, what you're going to see this video is actually made by, on my computer down in Guatemala while we're doing a trip. So it's not the best condition, but it says a lot about broken chains. Guatemala, country of the eternal spring, visited by millions who are attracted by their exuberant natural beauty. Rivers, lakes, valleys, impressive colonial constructions, majestic ruins, and the crib of the Mayan culture. But in the middle of this beauty, we can hear loud and clear the crying of the one who is prisoner of the cruel chains of poverty. And in the middle of the weariness and anxiety, it says, I'm hungry. I'm cold. Help me. Give me your hand. I need you. In well-developed countries, being poor means not having a car not having a home, not having a summer home, not having the dream job. But in Guatemala, being poor means not having food, not having a home to live, not having health, not having an education, not having a job, not having hope. Being poor in Guatemala means die by hunger or being a victim of illnesses originated by misery. Jalapa is a department located west of the country and it is not free from the cause of this terrible situation and we find all kinds of needs Kids dying of hunger, men and women suffering from all kinds of illnesses, and without a helping hand. But today, God is calling and guiding a group of men and women with a generous heart who wishes to give hope to those in need. This group of missionaries with a heart full of generosity and love for our brothers wishes to make this project a reality for Jalapa, place which they have fallen in love 
and have visited for nine years in a row, providing their medical knowledge to our people, providing as well as medication, food for our brothers to be able to provide a piece of bread, maybe a glass of milk, and a warm smile that every child wishes to have. These same people have the dream that this help that they bring once a year can be a permanent help in this place by building a clinic for medical assistance and a soup kitchen for kids services which will be provided free of charge with the assistance from the International Seven-Day Advent Church. Together, we can build a better future for our lovely Jalapa. Jesus said, for which you did it to one of the little ones, you did it to me. United, we can change sad and lonely hearts, breaking chains for humanity, destroying poverty, and placing smiles in the faces of people who need it the most, and answering to the call to the one the one said. I'm hungry, I'm cold, please help me. Our organization's Broken Chains of Humanity is inviting you today to unite in hard work to alleviate the burden of our brothers to fight against adversity. All of us can provide something in this that seems to never end. What we do for ourselves dies with ourselves. What we do for others and for the world will become immortal. It is so good to see you. And you notice on the screen that some of folks have, from Palacido have gone with us, Dr. Candy, of course, or, or Robin and Carol. And uh, it is uh, a growing thing. I just want to give, a, I was asking you a brief history of uh, our work, and I will make this short because I want to give you all the time we can, Pastor Lewis. Um, it was actually in um, 2005 that uh, I was pastoring at the Antioch Church, and then uh, Tanya came to my wife and I and asked us, why don't we do a mission trip? And I want to introduce you to her. This is Tanya, and uh, Tanya is uh, an American citizen, but she lives in Guatemala right now, and uh, she's always been helping us. In fact, Tanya and I had our first meeting with Antioch uh, people in Taco Bell. We thought it's a very appropriate place, and we started talking about, why do we go to Guatemala? And then that's, the Lord started to make it work. And this is Danny Casanasa, her uncle. Danny is um, our medical director. Uh, he, too, is from the same area that uh, Tanya is, the same area that we're working. So we had this family connection. And uh, so it's good to have you with us. Uh, Tanya just flew up from Guatemala City, actually. She's living there now. And um, Danny, you're living in Los Angeles, and you're a doctor, retired doctor down there. All right, so I'll just give you a brief history. You can go on forever, especially as a minister. I have to always be careful. The older I get, or the more I want to go on forever, but I, I can't do that. Um, so Tanya came up to us and said, why don't we do something in Guatemala? And so what happened after that, Tanya? Did you, how did you, what did you do to get us started down here? Well, first of all, good morning, happy Sabbath. Um, actually, we were um, thinking of going to India. And, well, I asked Mrs. Cook to put that uh, at the table uh, to talk about it. But um, then uh, you said better if we go to Mexico because we can expend less in tickets and help the people with that money for those tickets. And then finally... Eddie said, has got into Mexico on those years, and you changed your mind and said, well, let's put it on prayer. And then you will ask me one day by phone, uh, Mrs. Cook, and she said, Tanya, do you think we can go to Guatemala? And then we were talking also with you, and 
I was making some phone calls to some family members that are Adventists from, like the founders of the church in Guatemala, Adventists are from our family. And thanks God we got the place to go and a lot to do. Thanks God we have a lot to do in Guatemala. A lot of people need to be healed from the inside out. And that's how we started. One thing I appreciate, Tanya, what she did was that she made a phone call. and She talked to her relatives up in the Jalapa area and asked uh, if you could use some missionaries there. And uh, were they excited? No. <laughs> At the beginning, they were hesitating because, um, as uh, I don't know uh, if you always have those rules that uh, the locals, they have to invest a little so they can feel the project part of their own. And they were like, we don't have money. We cannot do that. And after a lot of prayer and calling here and calling there, they did open the doors. Right, and they, what you told me was that they actually said, well, we really were looking for missionaries, and that's why we had built all this ready for them to come. And so they were excited. That was 2005. Started in 2006, became a nonprofit uh, in 2010. And uh, I think we have done 13 mission trips. We've seen over, I mean, it's in the thousands as far as patients are concerned. And, of course, doing medical work and dental work. And Dr. Danny, um, can you tell us briefly about your connection, your father's connection to all of this? Good morning. Uh, well, I, I can say I feel um, honored for, by God for being a, one of uh, the descendants of for one of the pioneers in Guatemala. Um, he uh, accepted Jesus Christ in Nine, he was born in 1800s, but uh, 1920, 25, he accepted Jesus Christ. So he started being the, one of the powers that God sent there to that area to uh, start churches. Uh, to be short, uh, he may start uh, 200 churches around, around that area. And um, for some reason, God put me on the, on the way for these uh, beautiful people here to start uh, joining with them and uh, making a team and start working there. So we are working in that area for uh, 14 years. I have a lot of things to say, but the time is short. So that's all. I, I just uh, feel uh, privilege, the privilege of being a descendant of one of the pioneers in Guatemala for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We um, are just so thrilled because we have we're working up, now when I say working in a place, this is like two hours out of Guatemala City up in the mountains. We were working with people uh, in the mountains and suddenly we decided we'd go to this town called Coalis and you're gonna talk about that. And uh, we were, I, didn't, I said, Lord, why are we going to Coalis? It's a town, we wanna to go to the villages, to the Mayans. And it worked out and all I can tell you is that we went to Coalis and I don't wanna steal your thunder. But when we went there, there were 30,000 people in the town. There were Nova Seventh-day Adventists and uh, so we, we started to have meetings. We did medical clinics, five medical clinics by now, I don't know. We've gone 13 trips, like I mentioned. But all I know is, is that today, there is a church there in Colis that we started, plus we are supporting a pastor and a Bible worker, and uh, the work goes on in Colis. Pe the, people, the people in Guatemala, they went through a 30-year war, and they felt everybody betrayed them. Uh, they, it was, war was over in 1996. They are, um, they are broken. I know we're all broken, but they are broken and, and need so much and want to hear the gospel. When we start speaking, they listen. They, they look in their Bibles. Um, Jesus said, when the fields are ripe for harvest, you know, pray that God would send forth uh, harvesters. And that's what we need there because uh, we can't keep up with it, but that's a good thing not to keep up with. So um, to end, again, we go on, but Tanya um, and Dr. Danny, what did you do just recently in Guatemala that was uh, seen around the world? Oh, we have uh, the problem with the volcano. Um, I took uh, some days with my wife on vacation because she was tired. So we went to Guatemala and <laughs> Suddenly, we had the, the problem with the volcano, and uh, a lot of people suffered and died uh, because of that situation. And we were already there, so I say, well, God sent us here, so 
instead of taking some other days uh, vacation, we're going to start working. So we went went to the area was that was affected, and um, we started um, donating some food, some supplies, and other things for for the people, trying to give them some hope in this situation. Uh, it just it happens to 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 be that way, you know. We we didn't plan that. We just br broke the vacation half to help the people there. It was it was a very nice experience. We are building actually a clinic uh, up in the mountains so the mines can have free medical care, dental care, and also eyeglasses. We're also uh, going to build a place where a malnourished children can stay and recover. And this was on land donated to us uh, by a man that went through the clinic. He donated 18 acres for us to have this land to do this. Um, so I want to end with you, uh, Tanya. I'm going to show maybe three slides real quick. Can you tell me, um, what did you do? You called me, and what did you do? Something about a water catchment, or what was that? Um, well, yeah, when we went with Uncle Danny and Aunt Claudia, we, the first day after the tragedy, we were there like probably less than 12 hours after the tragedy. And uh, we saw the people crying and happy at the same time of seeing us. They wanted to share their stories, but they really liked uh, us to be talking to them about God. Some of them, they feel guilty. We did something, and that's why we are paying. And uh, when you talk to them and you minister to them, and they recognize that a volcano is like a, a physical, like a, something in geology that needed to release the gas. It's not that people is bad, and that's why it's happening. And they know that God loves them. One guy with his whole family told me, I feel so happy for this second opportunity of life. I tell the pastor always that I am so thankful to live again. And this life, I will live it with all my best. And I wish we can give that message to all the survivors. Because even the kids, sometimes they are asking, where is my school? I don't have it anymore. But they have God, and they have then everything. And Tanya called me about the volcano, uh, Broken Chains, we sent money down to help them. We are focusing on that one spot, but when, like an earthquake, we help earthquake victims, now volcano victims. And when that happened, we, you, you purchased or made it happen for a water, water a, not a catchment, but actually a water thing so the people can have showers. God bless. Thank you for all your work there. And now we're going to, uh, we've maybe already seen some of the slides from Tanya. As far as the envelopes are concerned, do you want to pass them out now? That's, that's what I like about the Palacito Church. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, you most of you know me and you know my family uh, Mercedes is here my wife she went stand up Mercedes. she went up and she went with me on this trip to Guatemala uh, I've been there twice and uh, my son Gabriel uh, also a member of this church right here went and uh, it was a wonderful it was it, it was such a, a wonderful experience because uh, it's not so much what what you give it's what you receive that's the important thing. And I have uh, here 10 quetzales that I want to give away here at Palo Cedro. Uh, uh, and the reason I'm, I'm talking about money is because I give a person of the value of money. Uh, we were area right here in Colis. Uh, outside, it's a, it's a giant a coffee place. And it's the best coffee around. This is the challenge. A person that works in the coffee, and it's always in mountains and stuff, makes 50 quetzales a day. Okay? No understanding of the value of that. Well, a pound of cheese costs 23 quetzales. Now, do you see the value? 
So do you think they're ever going to eat cheese? Never. Almost never. And uh, as we were uh, uh, dealing with the people in the village that just a few uh, kilometers outside of the main city, some of them have never seen a cabbage. They never see it. Because all they have is a, a piece of bread and they drink. What do they drink? Coffee. So the physicians that were there, uh, one day I was translating for a physician, and he kept asking, well, where does it hurt? It hurts here, it hurts there, and all kinds of little children, uh, five, six, seven-year-olds, they're all getting headaches and stuff like that. And I said, you're asking the wrong question. So I said, forgive me if I intervene, doctor. You've got to ask them this one question. How much coffee do you drink to a five-year-old? Ever since I got back, I promised God I will never, never, never again have coffee cake. I will never again drink decaf. I will never again, anything that has to do with coffee, I make this to God. I'm not ever going to do that again. Because... These little kids are drinking from five to six to nine cups a day. And the highest suicide rate in all Guatemala is in this town outside. What? What happens to your brain when you're a little kid and you're drinking coffee? What happens to it? It is messed up. So let me just say this. They're, those physicians were great but they ask the wrong questions. So what do we need? We need people that are educated that can teach them a different way of life. And they're open to the gospel. They truly are. As uh, Pastor mentioned, the 30-year the, the war, 1996, there, there is those officials that ran the government are all in jail right now, but the money was never recovered. So people live from day to day. And let me just say, down in the town where I was preaching on the street, it's a preacher's delight. Our people kept to organize them, you know, American mentality. They kept them outside, and they went out to sit in chairs. But not me, okay? I've been around. So I was preaching all and up the streets. Some of these people had walked for four hours to get a Band-Aid, to get a, uh, some glasses from the dollar store. Four hours. One gentleman who was epileptic, he had to start off even earlier because he takes falls on the way. There's no euphemism there. You understand what I'm saying. And then he, he was afraid to, he, when he got, when he was, he was given that, he could get uh, some glasses, the dollar glasses, he could get those, and he told my wife, he says, I've got to leave now, I don't have time to get the glasses because I'll start my journey and I'll have a fit on the way, and I don't know where I'll end up, in the, you know, in the gully, on the, and right there. So, and let me just say, the team that went down there, my son went, and, you know, he's a young man. Well, when he saw the team, he says, Dad, they look worse than you. <laughs> and it was a terrible-looking team. Let me, let me say, Chaplain Ron did not show all the pictures. He just showed the healthier group of volunteers. But let me just say to you, Moses was 80 years old when he went down. And is there anything impossible for God? And he went and got his wife pregnant. Can you, can you imagine the shame that she was feeling with all the villagers? And she's a pregnant old woman. Well, that's how God works. That's how he works. If you feel the Spirit of God working on you right now, and if you have children that do not respect you and are waiting for the day to you die to collect your stuff... Get rid of it all now. <laughs> I give you permission to do that. And it might be inspirational. 
So, so let me just say that the, 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 the most important thing that goes down there is an attitude of service. I raised sheep and goats on my ranch. And I used to, being a city slicker, put them together. But I found out that they're just like a bunch of church members. You got to separate the two. The sheep to one side and the goats to the other side. Because the goats are always complaining. I, every morning I have to break up the food that I give to the goats because they're whipping on each other every morning. They can't even eat together. Do you have church members like that? Absolutely. And that's okay. You need a few of them like that. It's just a little bit of salt taste, you know, of the earth. The sheep, when I feed them, they're all together. They're all together. But, you know, there's nothing dumber than sheep. So you need a pastor. So if you have a sense of calling today, I told, I, I gave meetings over there. And the first thing I said, I want you folks to remember Ezekiel 28. Remember Ezekiel 28. At the end, it talks about the devil. It talks about how beautiful he was and how powerful he was and how adorned he was. What a wonderful looking creature. But at the end, there's a fire that comes from within him and consumes him, and he is ashes upon the earth. And it says, the last line, I like Ezekiel 28. That's what I told the Guatemaltecos. It says, Ya no es más. He is no more. And you know, it feels good when your enemy is dust on the earth. So that's, that's how I start every meeting. And every meeting had to do with today is the day that the Lord has called you out. Today. Not tomorrow. Today. You do not have tomorrow. So think about this. Think about it. The other day, I have my mother at my house now. I stole her away from L.A. I went down, and she had, she's going to be 93 on August the 1st. And, uh, and anyway, uh, she's been saying, you know, I, can, I can't remember when I, was ba when I was baptized. And I call her on the phone, and, uh, and she says, you know, I need to, I think I need to get rebaptized. I don't even have a certificate. Will Jesus accept me without the certificate? <laughs> anyway, so my heart was touched. My heart was touched. So I went down to, to L.A., and, of course, she wants to sweep all the streets of L.A. She lives right on Whittier Boulevard. I mean, just really great section of town. And she's sweeping and sweeping and sweeping. And she's in pretty good shape. In fact, she's in good shape. She's at my house right now. But anyway, I went, out, I went further south to Escondido. And I went to a church where I had gone before. And I asked the pastor. He says, can I baptize my mother here? He said, have at it. So I baptized her three weeks ago. I kept her under a long time. <laughs> she was a wicked woman. I know. I know my mom. And you know there's a lot of wicked people here. And you know, you need works. You do need some works. And Jesus said, if you, you, know, you visit me, you, know, you give me a refuge. If you feed me, if you clothe me. That's what he says. That's the bottom line. It's not the mark of the beast. Who cares about that guy? He's already defeated. The job is today. Now, I'm going to give this 10 quetzales to someone that wants to do something today for these people that need Jesus. You have to come up and take it. Who's willing to do that? Just come up here. You want it? Come up. That's right. Because he calls us to step forward. There's not going to be any sitting in heaven. You know. And you think about what you can do. That's all I got to say, Pastor Ron.
<laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. Is your mother okay? Did, Okay, just just wondering. So, she's feeding the chickens. Okay, all right, with a snorkel or something like that. Anyway, so uh, we were supposed to be done by twelve. We have a lot to share. Maybe someday we'll come back and show more, Carol. But um, I do want to say one thing. Jana is in the back. You can wave, Jana. Uh, Jana was in charge of our fluoride treatment. We took two boys, and so we have a lot of connections. And uh, we appreciate you guys so much. Just as a recap, though, that some things I didn't cover is that we not, Broken Chains for Humanity has gone on six, 13 mission trips. I get more trips added as I keep talking. <laughs> 13, 13 mission trips. Uh, here, here's what we do. Uh, we always buy uh, 125 five food bags. Uh, the food bags are nutritious food that we give to people who are living at the dump. You saw a picture there of the dump. Uh, there are kids who live at the dump. That's where they find their food. You wonder why people are trying to get their kids to the border? Okay, I won't get too political here, but if you want to help Guatemala, then help them maybe where they're locally. And um, anyway, I won't get into that. <laughs> but let me tell you that um, it's, I, I saw them walking around. It was really hot. Uh, and, I, and they were trying to get what little water they could out of th throwing away water bottles. Um, you didn't see it, but actually um, when the kids look for food, and Jana, when you came to the dump for the first time with us, you were crying. Guess what? Mark Juarez was crying. And it, 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 the first time I saw it, you know, I started feeling teary. It, it moves your heart. We have no idea. We have no idea. And so that's one thing we do. And then uh, our, our program is, if you want to join us uh, during the day, we have a medical dental clinic uh, and, and eyeglasses. And even eyeglasses, let me tell you, I appreciate some of you giving eyeglasses. I mean, I remember sitting in front of a guy I gave some eyeglasses to, and he stood up and he, like he shouted, glory, hallelujah, because he could actually read his Bible. We have no idea. And um, so optical, and then in the evenings we always have evangelism. Uh, one time I spoke to actually in another town for to a thousand people. And uh, then we d went to different churches, six different churches and locals. And now you've done an incredible job preaching. So you have an envelope and uh, you're welcome to give that uh, to the deacons as you leave. You're welcome to donate or uh, wish me something. And the main thing is pray, pray for us. And now, Mercedes, come on up. I never realized how rich we are in this country. We take everything for granted. And uh, I am from El Salvador, Central America. I'm not from Guatemala. My husband went last year, and he was excited after he came back from, the, uh, from Guatemala. And it was during Thanksgiving, and I thought, oh, he will regret that he was not with us. No, he was excited that he had done something good in Guatemala. So he was trying to convince me for a long time. And I am a hospice nurse. I have been doing this for almost 19 years. And I thought, I am a hospice nurse. What can I do on a mission trip to go to those places? They don't need hospice nurses. And um, so I thought, well, I will pray about it, I told him. And I saw him getting prepared for this trip. So he went and bought um, 80 Bibles. And, uh, and he went to the dollar store and he got 61 of those uh, reading glasses. I thought, my, what are we going to do over there? Anyway, I thought, well, if I cannot help as a nurse there, I can help in the kitchen. So I said, okay, I will go because he said that there was a group of medical people that they were going. So I went and let me tell you, that has been one of the best experiences that I had in my life. We were there, we were helping these people, some people who had walked from up the hills and from the mountains to get a pair of glasses, reading glasses, and some just to be checked. Uh, and they, uh, the group said, okay, we need to stop for her to have lunch. I felt bad to stop to have lunch. 
lunch break because some people were in line uh, before six in the morning. They were already making um, a line on the street waiting for us to open the place. And that was going to be open at 9.30. So and if we could not finish treating all these people by the end of the day, they had to go back to the mountains, walk again two to four hours, and come back the following day. So I thought, this is too much. So my son was the other one that he took uh, lunch break just for a short time. And he even went to the... Um, um, the people, the police, how would they call those people that um, traffic uh, the security? Okay, anyway, some of those, uh, uh, they could not come. So my son went to treat them over there, uh, police officers. So in the first day, um, what I did, they assigned me to help to do teaching on nutrition. So it was good. And I was with a nutritionist, and so we were working together, and they needed a lot of help. Because this group uh, were 30, 32? How many people were, uh, how many people went in the group? About 30. We were not enough. We needed more people. And um, uh, in one of those trips, we went to the um, dump. People live there. Beside the dump, there is a cemetery. And the graves are not like the graves here in the States. The graves are like in, you know, third, third world. <laughs> so they, they put that uh, uh, on top of the, um, of the ground. So, and there were some pigs around there too. So then after that is the dump. And we went there, and several of us, we wanted to cry because you see these little kids with their mothers living there. So I saw this lady, and she was in line to get a number, so later on that afternoon, she was going to get a bag of food. And I got close to her, and I said, oh, you live here? And she said, yes, this is my home. And she showed me a little box covered with some um, pieces of cloth, and pieces of carton boxes, and she said that she lived there. So there was a mother with a young child, and I asked the child, oh, you live here, what is your home, your house? And he said, oh no, I don't live here. He said, I live at that cemetery. I'm on the graves with my mother. He thought that he was in better condition, just living there among the pigs in that place. And here we are in the States. If it is cold, we turn the heater on. If it is hot, the air conditioner, we have good blankets. Let me tell you, I have been so thankful to the Lord for his blessings. We can open just the faucet to get water, clean water to drink. We can get in the car and walk even to the store. These people, for a pair of glasses, $1 glasses, they had to walk hours. Some of the people, because I was um, uh, teaching nutrition, we had to modify it because they don't have money. And many people, uh, they said that their breakfast was a cup of coffee and a little uh, sweet bread, because those are the least expensive. And I said, and for lunch, because I had to keep a record of what they were eating because we were teaching. And for lunch, they said, oh, I eat better. I eat tortilla and salt. Going to work, and that was what they were taking for lunch. And I said, how about beans? Oh, that's for dinner. Beans and tortilla. And these kids, many of those kids, they go to school without food in their stomach, just coffee. And my husband said that that is a lot of coffee, but not coffee shops. They have coffee plantations. And the people just uh, picking up from what falls on the ground, they make coffee. So after they breastfeed the children for uh, the babies for six months, after that they start to give them coffee. So I was surprised that there was a child that he was nine, um, 
six years old, and he was drinking nine cups of coffee a day. This poor child, he was in a lot of, uh, uh, most of the complaints was headache, um, a stomach ache, and malnutrition, and hypertension. So uh, we're trying to teach these people. I thought, thank you, God, for sending me here. And you know what? If you cannot go, or you are afraid to go, or you don't feel that you cannot help over there, help with money. We have extra money here. We can go to the, to the store and we buy something that is organic, and we pay a lot of money for that to eat better. Those people, they don't have not even money to buy cheese, to buy milk, to buy um, uh, beans, enough beans. So we have money. We are rich in this country. We cannot say, no, I cannot help much. Let me tell you, we have a lot. And uh, I'm thankful to the Lord for that opportunity that he gave me to go there. And please, go. You have to see that firsthand, and your life will be changed. You will be willing to help. And this ministry, they have been doing this for several years. People are eager to get the knowledge that we have about nutrition, about health, about Jesus. We have a Bible worker over there. And I met her, and I told her, oh, do you have Bible studies to give? She said, yes, I have 72 a week. I don't have enough time to give those Bible studies. If we can help, we can have more Bible workers there because people, they are, um, they are happy when we talk about Jesus. And my husband, he was preaching on the street, wherever he find the people he was preaching. Jesus is coming soon. And many of those people, they will say that they were saved because the knowledge that people from the States help, for, help them to get that knowledge. Help with your presence going there, helping this ministry, or money, or send uh, glasses. Uh, I think, when is the next trip? November. November. So you can plan for that. Teach your children. You know, it is a blessing that the children are at home. The mothers can put the children in the, in the crib. They can uh, take the children in the morning to remove the pajamas. They don't have, they are dirty because they don't have a clean place. They try to be presentable when they go with other people, but they don't have enough. Just think about, okay, that your children are with you. But those mothers, they would like the best for their, their children, and they don't have the, the resources. Okay? God bless you. And I hope that you take this, uh, take this by heart. Uh, Pastor Cook asked me to tell the deacons to distribute the envelopes, if you please, or, or pick, uh, pick it up at the door. You know, I don't want to leave before something here. I don't know if uh, Dr. Candy is somewhere here. She belongs to this church, huh? Uh, God make a miracle through her hands uh, when she went there maybe eight years ago, soon, sometime there. Uh, she went there and she found a special patient that had uh, a little kid that had a heart condition. Uh, it was interesting that she she, she picked up that problem and uh, after that, uh, Broken Chains uh, took care of the case. We followed through all the procedures in order to prepare the, the kids for surgery uh, because he needed an open heart surgery. So. Uh, we all together work with that, but as I say, I say, um, Dr. Kenny was the one who found a patient. Um, a week ago, uh, no, uh, a month ago, 
uh, the family, the whole family from the village came to the central church in Jalapa to thank uh, God and to thank uh, Broken Chains and to thank the Seventh-day Adventist Church for, for that. Because the kid now is, is so happy. He's uh, 17 years old now, you know, and he's playing uh, soccer. And he said, now I'm happy because I can play soccer. But uh, the amazing thing is that God may st still make miracles, you know. So just uh, be God's hands to keep doing those miracles, you know, for before he comes, you know, second, second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, find us prepared to, to see our Lord and say, this is our Lord. We've been waiting for him. So...